This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com Baruch Ma'abom, welcome everyone. Rabbi Cheska Landau, known as the Noy de Yehudu, is one of the most exceptional personalities of the 18th century. He lived from 1714 to 1794, a descendant of the Maral, a descendant of the Rebbe of Heschel, and going back generations, a descendant of Rashi. His Talmud Muvak, the Tshuva Meyava writes just about his physical characteristics. He was the tallest man in the generation. You find the tallest man you know, the Noi Devi was taller. Says the Tshuva Meyava, Meyava, his thumb alone was double the size of anyone else's thumb. And as outstanding as his physical characteristics were, as great as his physical stature was, even greater was his spiritual stature. Sam Sefer writes about him, Rabban shel Kobne Hagoyla, Liban shel Yisrael, Karbanita de Safinta. He's the rabbi of all Jewry, the heart of Israel, the captain of the ship. One night, after Maravitz Rabbi Chesko was returning home, he happened to see a young Christian boy in tattered clothing who apparently got lost in the Jewish quarter late at night. The kid was held, holding empty baskets. And the kid was crying, Rabbi Chesko has compassion on the kid, he has Rachmanes. He approaches the child and he asks, Excuse me, can I help you? What are you doing here in the, in the Jewish quarter? Why are you crying? The kid begins speaking. He breaks out into a torrent of tears. The kid is telling his story amidst sobs. He says, I'm an orphan boy. I lost my mother and my father who is a baker remarried a witch of a woman. This mother is cruel. She's mean to me. Every morning she wakes me up early. She loads up my baskets with loaves and loaves of bread. And I have to make sure to sell all of the bread. And if when I return I didn't sell my quota of bread, the woman brutally beats me. And the boy says the way the day began. It seemed like it was going to be a whale of a day, a great day. A little after midday, I already sold all my bread. Have the rest of the day to rest. Have the rest of the day to play. As the day was coming to an end, and I was preparing to return home, I stick my hands in my pockets, and I'm looking for the 30 coins that I was expected to bring back for my sales. And the kid again starts his bitter tears. The coins were gone. They were gone. They must have been stolen. Must have been lost. And if I return empty-handed, she's going to beat me like a rented mule. I'm so worried to go home. I haven't eaten the whole day. And now I'm just wandering around, afraid to return. But because Galandel has Rachmanus on the poor boy, he brings the Christian boy into his home. He feeds the kid. When the child finished eating, Rabbi Cheskel hands the child 30 coins the money he was supposed to make from the sales, the kid returns, relieved, overjoyed. Years passed, many years passed. The Rav of Prague, Rabbi Cheskolanda, was already advanced in age. And this story that I'm about to tell you is published in the Sefer Mairesh HaSavos, Vayikra, page 14, in the Sefer Sorei Mea, the sixth volume, pages 38 to 41, the Sefer Gedolei Hadores, page 369 to 371. It's the Shvi Shal Pesach, the night of the seventh day of Pesach. It's after the Yom Tov Suda, and Rabbi Cheskel's family, the night of Judah's family is long sleeping. It's the dead of night. Rabbi Cheskel Landau is the only man up in the city of Prague. He's learning in his Sarm Shtib. Suddenly, Rabbi Chesko hears the pitter-patter of footsteps headed to his doorstep. Then, a very soft knock on the door. The door is forced open. A big, burly guy standing in the doorway. Rabbi Chesko looks at the man. Astonished. Who are you? What are you doing here? In the middle of the night, what have you come for? The guy looks around. Is anyone looking? He whispers to Rabbi Chesko, You don't know me. You don't recognize me, but I recognize you. I'm the boy, the Christian boy that you helped many years ago. You fed me. 
you comforted me, you even gave me money, you spared me from being beat, I've come to repay your kindness. You know, the Christians of Prague hate the Jews, bitterly. Last night in my father's house, he gathers all the bakers of Prague, and at the behest of my wicked stepmother, they have plot to kill all the Jews of Prague. They are all aware that tomorrow night after nightfall, the Jews will be hurrying to the bakers to be able to have some chametz. They're going to come running to the non-Jewish bakers now just as an aside. Normally we're not permitted to eat the bread of a private non-Jewish baker. It's called Paspalter. But apparently in the city of Prague back then, it was, there was a hoira shah, so to speak, to allow this after Pesach so the Jews would have bread to eat. And says this guy, that they have all made up together secretly at the behest of my wicked stepmother to put a deadly poison in all the bread of Prague and to wipe out the Jews of Prague in one night. If anyone finds out that I told you this, they'll kill me and it won't be good for the Jews. Rabbi, I trust that you won't let anyone know what I told you. And with that, the man disappeared into the night. Vicheska Landau, shaking, flushed, a look of death covers his face. He sits there in his study, pondering, hour after hour, what is he going to do? What is the best course of action? It may be dangerous to tell anybody about what he heard, but how will he save the Jews of Prague? And then like a flash of lightning, the night of Yehuda was struck with a stunning idea. The next day, the Rav orders that on Achor and Shal Pesach, all the Shtiblach, all the Batei Midrashim, would be closed. And on Achor and Shal Pesach, everyone has to come daven in the base Medrash Hagadol, in the large shul in Prague, followed by a major address by the Noid of Yehuda. The city of Prague is buzzing. There must be some out-of-the-ordinary news affecting all the Jews of Prague. The Rav is closing all the shuls to give a drasha to everyone on the last day of Pesach. Sure enough, the last day of Pesach... The Beis HaKnesses HaGadol of Prague is filled to capacity. And the Nadi Yehuda gets up to the podium to speak. Says the Nadi Yehuda, Rabbi Sai, we know that as the generations pass, and to our utter dismay, Torah knowledge weakens, the mind declines, the hearts are clouded. Even Torah leaders are prone to error. I am embarrassed, I am embarrassed as a Nehid of Yehuda to notify the Rabbim. And it is with great trepidation that I must admit that I made a terrible mistake. Even though our knowledge of the calendar is proficient, nevertheless after re-examining the way I and my Bezdin set up this year's calendar, we made a very terrible mistake that almost caused the residents of Prague to Ichamit this year. Our calendar is off by one day. We started Pesach one day early. Pesach really should start the next day, a day later. And therefore, my ride Rabbi Sai, please know, today is not the last day of Pesach. Today is Shvi Shal Pesach. And therefore, tomorrow, Asur Gomor Lechal Chametz Mashahu Adlamachar. No one may eat chametz tomorrow until the night time. The city of Prague was stunned, flabbergasted. How could such a mistake happen? But they all have the utmost respect and admiration for their Rav, Rabbi Cheskalandel. They abide by his psak and they have full faith. Amazingly, that year. The Jews of Prague celebrate nine days of Pesach. Bakers of the city of Prague can't understand. Why? What they thought was Matzah Yamtiv. Nobody's coming to buy bread. Now the Yehuda asked the police. He says, I think uh, something fishy about this bread. Maybe you want to test it on your dogs. Sure enough, they feed it to the, do- the dogs of the police. The dogs kill over. The bakers are apprehended. The residents of Prague were saved. Moira Verabosai. As we prepare for Pesach, Tavshinai and Dalid, Haba Aleinu Lataiva, 
We are so excited about the Yom Tif. We're looking forward. We're eagerly anticipating the Starim and all the mitzvahs we've been preparing for weeks. The Seder is the highlight of the year. And when we get to the bracha, Shehechiyanu v'kiyimanu 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 we will thank the Rebbe Shalom that He has sustained us and kept us alive to reach another Seder. But Rabbi Isai, not always in our history with Pesach, the joyous event that it is for us. In all honesty, throughout history, throughout the generations, many a Pesach was met with mixed emotions. Of course, we look forward to it. This man Chiruseinu. However, many, many Yom and Tavim of Pesach were prepared for with bated breath, great apprehension, fear, terror, panic. Not only because of episodes as the Noi de those times, but primarily because of what we all know as the infamous blood libels where Jews were falsely accused of kidnapping Christian children, slaughtering them and using their blood. The first instance of accused ritual murder or blood libel took place in 1144. It was instigated and fabricated by a monk named Theobald in Cambridge of Norwich. By the way, this monk Theobald was a Yid, a Meshumad. And when a 12-year-old boy named William, who was an apprentice tanner, who regularly came into contact with Jews as buyers, and he would assist in the homes of Jewish people, and his sudden death then was quite mysterious. And this Meshumad, Theobald, made the claim that every year Jews conspire to kill a Christian child. Sacrifice as a Pesach offering as part of their ritual. Shortly thereafter, this boy William was acclaimed as a saint. Miracles were attributed to him. He became known as Saint William of Norwich. And 30 years after, Thomas of Monmouth, an English monk, monk of Benedictine order, he recorded for all times in a book called The Life and Miracles of St. William of Monmouth, the entire episode. This was the first libelous account against the Jewish people. 1147, Lemisparum, three years after the first libel, the 22nd day of Adar, in Wurzburg, Germany, a Christian child is found in the river. Of course, the community of Wurzburg, the Jewish community of Wurzburg was blamed. This begins the Second Crusade. The Jewish community of Wurzburg is wiped out for three days. And while the Christians were already in the mode, they turned on other neighboring communities. And primarily on the 20th of Nisan on Cholamite Pesach, they massacre all the Jewish communities of the region. And they didn't stop until Shavuos. And if you want to read an account of this saga, all you need to do is open up the Machsur of Pesach to Shabbos Chalamoid, where the Yotzer of Shabbos Chalamoid was written by none other than Rabbi Yitzchak ben Shalom, the Baal Toysvis, where he memorializes this episode. 24 years later, libel spread all over France, where the majority of the Baal Toysvis lived. The Jews thought they would live in France, in tranquility. The main libel took place in Blois, where the entire community had the opportunity to convert, and every last one of them was Moisar Nefesh al Kiddush Hashem. Rabbeinu Tam was witness to this terrible libel in 1171. It spreads from Blois to Pantyis to Loches to Janeville. And Rabbeinu Tam, sensing perhaps that this would spell disaster and would reoccur many, many times in history. On the 20th day of Sivan that year, Rabbeinu Tam had a scribe record that the 20th day of Sivan be permanently established as a fast day for the Jewish people. And if you look in the Sefer, Gezerah Ashkenaz Vitzarfas, page 126, page 142, page 145, it is written by the Rishonim that the 20th of Sivan is even more significant than Tainus Gedalia, than the fast of Gedalia ben Achikam, Sam Gedalia. 13th century, 1264, the libel spreads to England. 
all over England, Jews are murdered. In London alone, 1,500 Jews are slaughtered. Some Jews escaped by hiding in a castle, but because of libels, life became unbearable for Jews in England. In 1291, Jews were permanently banned from living in England, could not return until the 17th century in the times of Oliver Cromwell. Prague, 1389, last day of Pesach, thousands of Yidin are murdered because of libels. Given the opportunity to convert, not one Jew takes the bait. All the Jews of Prague were Moser Nefesh, HaKidosh Hashem. Many legends are told how in the 16th century, the Maral of Prague makes a goylam to save the Jewish community from different libels. One of the most tragic episodes occurred at the end of the 15th century. Rabbi Yisrael of Bruna, Nari Bruna, disciple of the Chumas Hadashan. After the death of the Chumas Hadashan, Mari Bruna is recognized as the greatest Torah scholar and halachic authority in all of Germany. Rabbi Yisrael Bruna had already been imprisoned on two separate occasions for libelous and spurious charges which he managed to extricate himself from. But in 1474, one of the most vicious accusations were hurled when the body of a boy from Trent, Italy, his name was Simon, was found in a river on Easter Sunday, which happened to be the first day of Pesach, shortly before Simon went missing. Bernardino Feltre had delivered a series of vicious sermons vilifying the Jewish community. So when the boy was lost, the boy's father decided the Jews must have killed his child, drained his blood, supposedly for use in the Passover matzos. Eighteen Jewish men arrested. They were interrogated under judicial torture. Eight men, so to speak, confessed. They were executed in late June. Another committed suicide. News of the story spreads all over Italy, spreads to Germany. Meanwhile, this Simon became a saint, he became venerated. Instantly over a hundred miracles were attributed to this so-called saint. A cult develops, spreads across Italy, Austria, Germany, and all the way in Germany, if you ever heard anything more ridiculous in your entire lives. Rabbi Yisrael Bruna, the God of Hadar, the Rav of Ragensburg, he's imprisoned and accused of being part of the conspiracy. Rabbi Yisrael Bruna was about to be burned at the stake when an apostate finally confessed and Rabbi Yisrael escaped by the skin of his teeth. And if you think that Christians today don't venerate and worship Saint Simon, then think again. Till this very day, Catholics in Italy celebrate every March 23rd as Torture of Simon of Trent Day. Maybe they give out little bobbleheads of Simon of Trent. And although the Pope removed Simon from the calendar in 1965, if you think that blood libels, in the opinion of the world community, is a thing of the past, then all you need to do is visit the picture gallery in Harvard University, where our very own President of the United States was so-called educated. And you go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the picture gallery of Harvard University, and you'll see a caricature entitled, The Torture of Simon of Trent. The picture depicts six Jews standing around the child's body. Two Jews in the center of the picture, are piercing the child with long needles. Two above supervise the deed while holding a book written in Hebrew. And two below catch the drops in test tubes. Now we should note that the blood libel accusation was not germane to the Christian world, but there were blood libels in the Arab world. Reb Kleinimus Baal Hanes, who's buried on Harazesim in the valley near the cover of Zechariah Hanavi, Save the Jews of Yerushalayim from a blood libel. Arabs in Yerushalayim killed one of their own. Killed the child, they take the body, they throw it during the night into the courtyard of the Beis HaKnesses. Jewish community is terrified, what are they going to do? 
They knew what would happen. It was Shabbos day. Comes Reb Kleinim as Balanes. He had to be Mechalo Shabbos. He writes on, writes on a parchment certain mystical names of God. He placed it on the slain Arab child's forehead. Immediately the boy stands up, comes to life, runs to the house of the Arab murderer. He killed me. He's the right say. Jewish community was saved. But you should know Rav Kleinimus had charot that he was bitzar his whole life. That he was forced to be Mechal Shabbos. So he issued that upon his demise, whenever someone comes to visit his grave, you have to give the kever skila. He wanted the visitors to stone his grave. And the Anshe Yerushalayim follow his orders and every passerby adds a stone to the kever. During the age, the end of the Middle Ages, the blood libel spread to many countries. Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Eretz Yisrael. There were libels in Hebron. It knew no boundaries and soon all the Arabs. The Arab lands learned very well from their Christian counterparts. Parenthetically, when I was a Bachar, I had the great opportunity to hear one of the tzaddikim of our generation, one of the greatest disseminators of Torah of the last century, Harav HaGoyin, Rabbi Victor Miller, Zechafak Tavracha, who writes the following in his book, Awake My Glory, Ura Kavaydi. There is a very important lesson that the Jewish community can learn from the blood libels. Because perhaps in a moment of weakness, a Jew may think, look at the success of the world religions. Look how many followers the world religions have. How many billions of people? There must be something to it if so many people believe in it. And the response, the answer, is right at hand. Now the truth is we don't need answers, we don't need a response. Christianity? Even a child could understand. What kind of God is it that dies? What kind of Messiah is it that instead of bringing world peace, brings more bloodshed than anyone in history. What kind of son of David is he who claims to have no father? Islam, we know what the Rambam writes about Muhammad. The Rambam called him the Meshuga who came from the desert. The Quran is a historical distortion of epic proportions. It's a comic book. According to the Quran, Paro didn't know what to do with the Jews, so he consulted with his chief advisor, Haman. But maybe in a moment of weakness, a person may get caught up in the numbers, look how many followers, and then we're reminded numbers are unimpressive. These are the same people who believe in all honesty in the blood libels that we put blood in our matzos, we who salt every piece of meat that we eat to get out every vestige of blood, they believe in the blood libels. And then we realize that blood libels reflect on everything else the non-Jewish world believes in. Just as they believe in this fabrication, just as they believe in this nonsense, this absurdity, we are likewise unimpressed by everything else they believe in. We're not impressed with their opinions on morality, on relationships. Yeah, but so many people accept deviant lifestyle. Nah. These are the same people who accept other fabrications. And just as the libels are mere inventions of their corrupt and distorted fantasies, so all their beliefs and opinions are merely figments of their corrupt imagination. Blood libels became one of the fundamental tenets of Christianity. It became part and parcel of the very fabric of their religion. Let me read to you a quote, a statement of Martin Luther. And I quote, The Jews attempt at every opportunity to murder Christians in secret. Blood libels became so rampant in Poland in the 18th century that a Polish writer named Kidowitz writes, 
there does not exist one Jewish matzah that is not baked with Christian blood. One of the most tragic periods we have had to endure were the Frankists, who were Jews who abandoned their faith to believe in the false Messiah, Jacob Frank. As torturous as European history was, very possibly the most difficult period was the chapter of the Frankists who fulfilled that which the Navi tells us, Meharsayich, Umacharivayich, Mimeayich Yetzeyu. The Frankists publicly testified, and these were Jewish Mishumadim, that any Jew who has a Muna in the Talmud and in the, in the Gemara believes that it is a mitzvah to shech the Christian child and put its blood in the matzah on the first night of Pesach. Now listen to this. The Frankists told the authorities that the words Tetzach Adash Piachav are not really an acronym for the Makos Dam Sephardea Kinim of Devar, but rather Tetzach Dam Srichim Kulanu We all need blood. Adash Al Derech Sha'asu The same way we did. Piachav the same way the sages did with the Yoizel in Yerushalayim. And the Chachamim were actually summoned to trial to dispute this accusation. And as reported in the Sefer, on the Mayadim, page 110, listen to how they defended the accusation. Ditzach, divrate Sayrereinu, Kozov, the words of our adversaries are false. Adash, Ali Loistam, Sheker, the blood libels are for, false. Be'achav, B'nai Avraham, Khalil of Azais. In his hate sheet, Der Sturmer, Julius Streicher, Yamach Shemai Vezichoy, published several excerpts from church inspired ritual trials, including the infamous trial in Trent that we mentioned earlier. Here is an example of one of Streicher's historical gems. Says Julius Streicher, Yemach Shemai. The rules are as follows. The blood of the victims is to be tapped by force. On Passover, it is to be used in wine and matzos. Thus a small part of blood is to be poured into the dough of the matzos and into the wine. The mixing is only done by the head of the family. And the procedure is as follows. The family head empties a few drops of the fresh and powdered blood into a glass, wets his fingers of his left hand and sprinkles it on everything on the table. The head of the family then says, Thus we ask God to send the ten plagues on all the enemies of the Jewish people. Then they eat and the head of the family exclaims, May all the Gentiles perish and they consume the blood of the child. Now, this is a innocuous version of it. This is the English translation of what Streicher wrote. In its original, Streicher asserted, the head of the household cries out, Dam Diachinim Herof Jzin Prech Herba Horsin Mashush Pahoros which of course is Dam Sephardeya Kinim Aroiv Dever Shechin Barad Arbe Choyshech. And then Streicher wrote, the Jews in Kant, Svach Chaba Moshcha Kol Hagoyim, which was his version of Shefei Chamoscha El Hagoyim. And it's quite remarkable that if you look in the Sefer, Heichal Ledivrei Chazal Upeskameyam, by Rav Shimshon Wertheimer, he has an expression there, Shower your love on the Gentiles. Which was actually a nusach that many Haggadahs had in the Middle Ages. Which means, shower your love on the Goyim. And out of fear of blood libels, many communities would open their doors in the middle of the Seder. And to protect their lives, their Haggadahs actually read, Shifoich Ahavascha El Hagoyim. Now, Rabbi Sai, aside from knowing 
this information because of its historical significance, there are a number of halachic ramifications that the blood libels have had on the Seder and the observance of the halachic details of the Seder. We know we have an obligation to drink the Dalit Kaisas, the four cups of wine, the night of the Seder, the Shechan Aruch writes in some Tafayin Beis, Sefiralif Mitzvah Lachsar Achar Yayin Edoim. It's a mitzvah to use red wine. And the Ramah adds, unless the main halavan Meshubach Limeno, unless the white wine is superior. Says the Taz in Sifkat on Taz, why is red wine preferred? There are two reasons. Number one, it says in Mishle, Altera Yayin Ki Yisadam, don't be drawn by wine, although it is red. We see from here the red color of wine is an attractive quality of the wine. And number two, the Taz says, it is a remez to the blood of the children that Paroi slaughtered. Now listen to a Taz. Vihoidna, and now in the 17th century, Nimnu milikach yayin adayim. We refrain from using red wine. Mivne alilo shkarim, because of blood libels. Ba'avoy noiseinu arabim. And the Mishnah Brewer written in the 20th century echoes the words of the Taz in Sifkat al Says the Mishnah Brewer, Mukai Mishnah Mutsin Hagoyim Lahalo Alilo Shkarim. In communities where there's a danger of the libel, Nimnoim Milikach Yayin Edoim. We refrain from taking red wine. Of course, we know the Seder begins with the declaration called Dichvin Yeisei Veyechal. We call out, all the hungry should come join us to eat. What an empty offer. Let the hungry come and join us to eat. What kind of offer is that? With the doors locked and bolted? And nobody on the outside? Who could even hear it? The ancient custom, however, of keeping the doors of the house open for the entire Seder would explain the sincere nature that this request, that this offer is meant as. However, out of fear of Passover raids from Christians looking to revenge the murder of their children, this custom had to be abandoned. But what can we do? We're determined to do our very best. And that is why, after drinking the third cup of wine, we open up the door for Shveich HaMazcha. Blood libels have almost certainly been the most common and frequent occurring Jewish tragedy. Scholars estimate between 1880 and 1900, there were over 100 instances of blood libels against European Jews. Historians write definitively, there was not one single city in all of Russia, Poland, Lithuania, that did not suffer from these terrible accusations. I'm embarrassed to mention it in a shul. May 1st, 1989. There's a nationally syndicated television show. Oprah Winfrey. 8 million viewers. She hosts a Jewish woman who testified on national television that she personally witnessed ritual sacrifice of children by her Jewish family. It's not very typical, this woman testifies, but she allowed that such murders take place in Jewish families throughout America. Broadcast on open TV waves, United States of America. No public protest. You may be interested to know, January 23rd, 1990, Jerusalem, Repo Jerusalem Post reported, that as the police and FBI searched for a little 12-year-old boy in Minnesota, Jacob Wetterling, St. Cloud, Minnesota, who was a presumed kidnapped victim, flyers and posters in the area read, Where are our missing children? And the posters answer, Jewish ritual murder, January 23rd, 1990, Minnesota. United States of America. And if you can't bear to hear this anymore, neither can I. Comes along with the and Wasserman, Hashem Yimkon Damai. And he asks a very daring question, a question that takes a lot of courage to ask. 
And that is, why does Hashem make this happen? What did we do? Where did we go wrong? Especially, it says, Abuchana in the Kavitz Namarim, Peiches Peites. We have a general rule. A lie can only be sustained only if it's based on a kernel of truth. Otherwise, it has no kiyom. And yet, this terrible accusation of the blood libels is not even based even on a microscopic semblance of truth. We salt our meat to get out every vestige of blood. We crack open an egg, there's a blood spot, we discard the egg. The one people that is so much further away from this type of behavior than any other nation is Kalal Yisrael. And yet the blood libels, such a mad lie, is the most oft-repeated lie in the history of mankind. Says Rabbi Hanan, V'zehu mi pilei ha this is one of the wonders, one of the mysteries of God's providence. Says Rabbi Hanan, V'davar Baruhu. It is clear then that since God is a dynamis, a just judge, Bevadai ha'oynesh hazeh akla Yisrael hu mechuvan mida kneged mida. You have to say that this punishment has been meted out to the Jewish people, measure for measure. In Latin, we call it quid pro quo, for some type of sin that we must have committed. And now Rabbi Hanan says one of the most frightening things I have ever come across in my entire life. Every time I think of it, it sends shivers down my spine. Says Rabbi Hanan, Be'elule she'en any kedai. Perhaps I am unworthy to say such a thought. But if I would be worthy, I would say the following. That it corresponds to the sin of dipping the cloak of Yosef HaTzadik in blood. Says Rabbi Chana V'yim Shagisi And if I have made a mistake, Hashem Yichaper Ba'adi, let God forgive me. Says Rabbi Hanan, we sold our brother to Mitzrayim. And we fooled our father into thinking that Yosef was ripped apart by a wild animal, Taraf, Taraf, Yosef. We took his Ksenis Pasim, we dipped it in blood. We fooled our father. It was an absolute lie! It was Sheker, the very first blood libel! We made the first blood libel. We invented it. The Jews invented it. Why? Because we couldn't get along with our brother. And therefore, says Rabbi Hanan, because we fooled our father with this lie, Taraf Taraf Yosef, in every generation, we pay the price, Mida Kenegin Mida, with this terrible and harsh punishment. And one may ask, is it indeed true? The Mechiras Yosef is of such severity that every generation bears responsibility for the sin. We know that to be the case with the Chet HaEgal where the Pasuk says Uviyayim Pakti Ufakarati that every time the Rebbe Nishon Mitzad punishment to Klal Yisrael there is always some punishment from the Egal, but is the sin of Mechiras Yosef of the same nature? And in fact if you look at the writings of Rav Meir Simcha of Dvinsk, Parshas Achri Mois, Parak Tezayin, Pasuk Lamed, Rav Meir Simcha writes in the Meshachachma that the Mechir Yosef is the counterpart of the Chedo Egal. Whenever Kla Yisrael sins, Benadam Lamakoim, God visits punishment from the Chedo Egal. And whenever we sin, Benadam Lachaveroi, Hashem visits us with punishment from Mechir Yosef. The Chet Ho'egel and the Mechir Yosef are the two father sins, the two cardinal sins. That is why on Yom Kippur we conclude the main body of Shemana Esrei. Ki ata solchan li Yisrael. God, you forgave, you gave slicha to Yisrael. When did God give a slicha? Salachti kivarecha. 
by the Chet Ha'ego when we said, Eile Eloi Hecha Yisrael. Umechalam, the Shifte Yeshur, and when was God Moichal? The Shifte Yeshur and the Mechir Has Yosef. This is the landmark Chiddush of Rabbi Hanan Vassarman. Blood libels are a punishment for what we did to Yosef, what we did to our brother. Comes along Rabbi Matasio Solomon, Mashkiach of Beis Medrash Govaya, and he asks an even more daring and courageous question. Okay, I got it. Blood libels are an atonement for Mechir Yosef. So let's think about the timing. Why does it always happen Pesach time? Why Pesach? Now this is not a question that I can ask. This is not a question any of us can ask. But G'day Yisrael, who have insight into the Darke Hashem, ask Rav Matasyahu, why Pesach time? And with this we come to a most powerful aspect of the Pesach Seder. In our minds, the Seder focuses on two things and two things only. Shibud, bondage, bitterness of Egypt, the Marar, and Geula, redemption, salvation, the Cherus, the Matzah, Shibun and Geula, Marar and Matzah, bondage and freedom, and yet there's one aspect of the Egypt experience that we seem to ignore, that seems to be forgotten, and that is, how did we get to Egypt in the first place? What was the primary cause that brought us into Golos? And even the most uninitiated, uneducated Jew understands the most direct cause of going down to Golos Mitzrayim. We all know it. It's a simple reading of the Psukim. It was the sin of Mechiras Yosef. We sold Yosef down to Mitzrayim. There was hunger in Canaan. The brothers regretted what they did. They went looking for Yosef. Lo and behold, Ani Yosef HaOid Avichai. Yosef reveals himself. Yaakov and his sons end, uh, end up going down to Mitzrayim because we sold Yosef. We could not get along with our brother. And now the question is, we spend so much time on the Seder dedicated to the freedom. We symbolize that by eating matzah. We spend so much time with the bondage symbolized by the marar. Why don't we do anything to symbolize the third aspect of the Egypt experience? How do we get there in the first place? And upon further examination, we will see that in fact, there are many things that we do the night of the Seder to symbolize how we ended up in the Mitzrayim in the first place. Let's talk about the Karpas. Mishnah Bura brings down the well-known reason for Karpas. Samach Perach. 600,000 Jews worked in bitter labor. But Rabbeinu Manoyach, one of the Rishonim, one of the Noise Kalim on the Ramam, gives us the definitive reason for Karpas. Because the night of the Seder, you can't just remember the bondage, you can't just remember the freedom. You have to remember how you got to Mitzrayim in the first place. Says Rabbeinu Manoyach al Rambam, Vani Noyagim, Vanu Noyagim the Karpas. Our custom is to use Karpas. Zechar Liksoynes. Ha-pasim she'asa Yaakov avinu li-yosef. To remember, the multicolored tunic that Yaakov made for Yosef, asher b'sibasa nizgalgel hadava, that because of it, matters transpired. The yardu avaseinu l'mitzrayim, and we ended up in Egypt. So you'll ask, what in the world does karpas have to do with the ksenis pasim? Karpas. What does karpas mean? Look at Rashi on the words Ksenes Pasim and Chumash Parshas Vayeshev. Zokt Rashi, Ksenes Pasim, Lashon Kli Milas. Karpas means a wool garment. Like in Megillah says there, Chor Karpas Usecheilas. Karpas in Megillah says there means a woolen garment. Karpas specifically refers to one woolen garment. The garment of Yosef. At Zben Eshchai, Parshat Tzav, Kar, comes from the word Mecher, referring to Mechir Asi Yosef. Pas, comes from the word Pasim. We dip it in salt water to start the Seder by teaching a lesson. How did we end up in Mitzrayim? Because we sold Yosef and dipped his cloak in blood. Says the Shalos of Chubas Marshal and Simon Pei, and it's brought down by the Achorinim, Simon Tafai Involve, that when it comes time to eat the Afikoinen, swing it over your shoulder, look Dalet Amos, and say the following, Kach, Hayu, Avriseinu, Holchim, 
and Mishar Roisam, Tzru Roisam, this is how our ancestors left Mitzrayim with their bundles slung over their shoulder. As from Shloyma Kluger in the Yeriya Shloyma, who cares how the ancestors left Mitzrayim? We have to do every single thing that they did? That's how they happened to carry it in those days. They slung things over their shoulders. Do we have to carry mules into our house the night of the Seder? Because our ancestor has had mules? It says of Shomla Kugor, look in the Gemara, Sachem Samachem and Beis. The Gemara brings a Brisa <coughs> that says, Tana, Kal Echad, Vi Echad, Noisein, Pischai, Ba'ayra, Yomav Shalachayrov. Every individual would take the current Pesach, put it in its hide, and sling it over her shoulders. Amar Ravi Lish, Ravi Lish says, Tayos. You have to carry it, Tayos. Tayos, not Fios connection. Tayos. What does Tayos mean? Zagdrashi, Derech, Soicharim, Yishmaelim. Like Arab merchants. What in the world is going on over here? Like Arab merchants? Why would you carry your carbon Pesach like Arab merchants? Says Abshalom Kluger. This Gemara has always been a mystery to me. What is Rav Elish saying? Tayos like Arab merchants. Says of Shlomo Kluger, Rav Hashem opened up my eyes. And I realized the night of the Seder we commemorate the freedom. We commemorate the bondage. But why don't we do anything to commemorate how we ended up in Mitzrayim? Why don't we do anything to commemorate the Mechir Yosef? And then I realized, says of Shlomo Kluger, that we have to take the Afi Koyman and carry it. Like Derech Soicharim Yishma'ilam. Because remember what it says when we sold the Yosef. By Yisu Esenayim. By Yeru, the Hine Yishma'ilim Ba'im. The brother saw a group of Arabs. By Yimkor Es Yosef La Yishma'ilim. Oh, now I get it. Chazal say, you take your Afi Koyman, you take your Karim Pazach, and you don't just remember freedom. You have to remember how you got into Mitzrayim in the first place. Because he sold Yosef to a bunch of Arabs. Mm-hmm. So the night of Pesach, we don't ignore how he ended up in Mitzrayim. We don't ignore that the root of it was the Sinas Ha'achim. We couldn't get along with our own brother. We carry the, the Afikoyman like Arab merchants. We dip the Karpas like Pasim into the salt water to remember the dipping. Says the Ben Eshchai in Manishtana, we point out that the night of Pesach, there are two dippings. One to commemorate the dipping that brought us down to Mitzrayim. And one to commemorate the dipping that got us out of Mitzrayim. One to commemorate a dipping of hatred. And one to commemorate a dipping of Achdos. The first dipping commemorates a dipping of hatred. The dipping of brothers who couldn't get along. And one dipping represents B'nai Yisrael finally saying, enough is enough. Enough of sinas china, Enough hatred. And they came together in Mitzrayim. Be'aguda achas. And what did they dip in the blood of the Pesach? Agudas ezoiv. The word aguda means one group. That signifies that they rectified the first dipping of the Xenis Hasim. And now they were coming together as brothers. The Aguda Achas. Ahavas Achim. And therefore says Rav Matasiel Solomon, Oyoim Benoya. An absolutely bone-chilling thought. The night of Pesach, as we dip the Karpas, as we carry the Afi Kaiman, like a bunch of Arab merchants, and we remember that it was the hatred that we had for our brother that got us into this mess to begin with. And we all know that what got us into that mess is what has us in the mess we're in today. 2,000 years of Golis, says the Gemara Yuma, Sinas Chinam. And the night of Pesach, as we're dipping the Karpas, as we're slinging our Afikoyman over our shoulder, it's the time of the year we finally have to correct and rectify once and for all the Avera of Mechilat Yosef. And God is giving us an opportunity. He's reminding us, take the Karpas, take the Afikoyman. 
And if we don't correct Mechirat Yosef, we are liable for Mechirat Yosef. Says Ramatusil Solomon, a bone chilling thought. That is why historically the, bo- the blood libels have always taken place Pesach time. Because Pesach is the opportunity to correct the sin. Because after all, the night of Pesach, we need to feel Kulanu B'nai Ish Echad Nachna. Perhaps the most well known of all the blood libels is what became known as the trial of the century was the main Mendel Bayless case, the notorious defendant in the 1912 blood libel in Kiev. And to me it is quite eerie and very ironic that one of the critical points of discussion of that trial was the Gemara Nyevamas with comments on the Pasuk, Zeus Hatayra Adam Kiyamas Vayal Amar Reb Shun Bar Yechai Ein Kivrei Akum Metamen Vayal Goyim don't Render something tame, because atem kruyim adam. Jews are called adam. Being oide avide zara kruyim adam. Goyim are not called man. They're not called adam. And there's great fear that the prosecutor in the Baelish trial would cite this gemara as proof that the Jews are virulent supremacists who think that members of other religions are subhuman and can be murdered. Baelish's lawyer, a man named Meza, conferred with the illustrious Rav of Galina, of Meir Shapiro, who later go on to establish the Lublina Yeshiva, the Lublina Rav. Rav Meir Shapiro advised the lawyer to explain the following to the courtroom. Tell the court to consider what would happen if an Italian man would be arrested and tried in court. Would the other Italians congregate and pray for his welfare and safety? What about if a Frenchman was on trial? Would all his countrymen pray for him? Of course not. They would go on their merry way. Said Ramey Shapiro, the Jewish people are unique. One Jew is arrested and put on trial, and Jews worldwide are concerned for his safety. That, says Ramey Shapiro, is what the Gemara means. There are many ways in Hebrew to say person. Ish in plural is Anoshim. Gever, in plural, is Gevarim. There is one expression. Adam. There is no plural for the word Adam. Adam is singular. That is why only the Jewish people are called Adam. Only the Jewish people are one entity, united, and only we can collectively be called Adam. So you tell the judge, tell the court, says Ramey Shapiro, that only Kal Yisrael are one entity. The nations of the world are just a collection of individuals. Isn't it eerie? Isn't it ironic? That this is the lesson that emerged from the blood libel? And as we have learned, in fact, the blood libel is the reminder that perhaps we are not fulfilling our unique role in this world as Adam. One nation united. You know, we always speak, why can't Jews get along? Chasidim, Misnagdim, Ashkenazim, Svardim. Aren't we all brothers? Kulanu Ishecha Nachnu? And it really got me thinking that maybe the reason we have such a hard time loving our fellow Jew. Isn't he my brother? Because we can't love our own brother. We lost the feeling of what a brother is. Because before we start worrying about getting along with Hasidim or Sfardim, because they're our brothers, can we get along maybe with our blood brothers? I mean, can we? Because if you can't get along with your brother, and you can't get along with your sister, and you can't get along with your cousin, if you can't get along with your own family, then what business do you have talking about Ahavas Yisrael? How can you love your Jew like your brother if you can't even love your brother? There's a rub in a very large shul. It tells over a phenomenon. 
that he witnesses repeatedly, almost on a monthly basis. He'll be standing in a hospital bed of an elderly congregant about to leave this world. Gathered around the bed is the family, and into the room, a long-lost brother or sister walks in. The rest of the family is astonished. They haven't seen the family member in decades. And they say, I'm so sorry my brother is unconscious now. I would have really liked to speak to him before he went. We haven't spoken in 40 years. The Rav asks, What happened? Why weren't you speaking to each other? And almost without exception, the answer is, Hmm. Not sure. I don't remember. And now it's too late. Boy, it must have been a really important disagreement if they can't even remember what it was. Kliyakar and Pashas Nasai says something very disturbing about Machlekes within families. He says Shalom is so important that the dead need Shalom. Not because there's any conflict between people after they go up to Shamayim. But rather, if there's any conflict between children here in this world, then those who have passed away are in terrible pain. Like needles piercing their flesh. They know no peace in the grave. Says the Kliyakar, and how common is this in our times? And how common is this in our times? We're all so worried about world peace. All Jews, drop their differences. We're one family. Well, start with your own family. Because if you love a stranger, because you can't love a stranger like your own family, if you can't get along with your own family, if you can't get along with your uncle, your aunt, your cousin, your brother, and your sister. Reb Chaim Knievsky, who doesn't waste a moment, every era of Pesach he makes a siyam, on Shaz Bavli, Yushami, Medrash, Mishnah, Tanakh, a man who makes very good use of his time. When his parents were alive, he used to go visit his mother every morning. His mother would make him breakfast, and he would sit with his father, the stipler, and inevitably they would be speaking and learning. When Reb Chaim's mother passed away, he, his visits were not as frequent. One time his father happened to mention to him, no, I also enjoyed the visits. Reb Chaim felt very bad that he had neglected his father upon his mother's passing. And Reb Chaim once again began to visit his father, the stipler going every single morning. Meanwhile, Reb Chaim's sister, Rebetzin Barjan, her husband passed away and she moved in with the stipler to take care of him. This time when the stipler passed away, Reb Chaim continues until today to visit his sister. G'day Yisrael, who have all of Kla Yisrael on their shoulders, but they understand that Avas Yisrael begins with their brother and sister. Let's conclude with the story, the legend, and if you want an interesting experience, investigate the origins of this story and you'll find out many interesting things. But in any event, this is a story that's brought down in Svarim, one Sefer, Sipuri Yushalayim, Legends of Yushalayim, on page 77. Long before the Beis Hamikdash was built, there were two brothers who lived and farmed on that exact location. One was married, had a large family, while the other was single. They lived in very close proximity to each other. Each worked his land, growing wheat. Harvest time arrived. Each was blessed with a bountiful crop. And they piled up their grain for long-term storage. The unmarried brother observed his good fortune. He thinks to himself God blessed him with a lot more than he needed. Whereas his brother was blessed with such a large family, could surely use some more wheat. He would wake up in the middle of the night and secretly take from his grain and put it in his brother's pile. The married brother similarly thought to himself that he was fortunate to have children who would care for him in his old age while his brother would depend on what he saved. He too arose in the middle of the night and quietly transferred grain from his pile to his brother's. 
In the morning, each one cannot figure out why there was no noticeable decrease in their own pile. And so they repeated the transfer the next night. These nocturnal activities went on for weeks, for months. A great enigma, a great mystery. And finally, one night, on one fateful night, the brothers bump into each other. And at that moment, in the dark of the night, the glow of brotherly love lit up the mountain sky. They each understood what they had been doing for each other and fell on each other's arms in loving embrace. When the Rebbe Shalom looked down and saw this display of Avas Achim, he selected Haha Maria as the place for the building of the Beis Hamikdash. So the story goes. For the last 2,000 years, we conclude the Seder every year with Shana Habav Yerushalayim. But we're still here in Golas. And we all know the reason. We all know it. Sinas Chinam. We're all brothers and we can't get along. And one thing is for sure, that if you can't get along with your actual brother, the Sinas Chinam for your virtual brothers will never disappear. Because if you can't love your blood brother, how could you love the rest of Kali Yisrael? But if even two brothers can display Ahavaz Chinam, who knows? Maybe that's all it will take. For the first base Hamikdash, it just took two brothers. It only took two brothers. And maybe this time around, maybe all it will take is two brothers. Shana haba, b'shalayim habnuya, v'yazka al-tzedek, hea v'yamenu, amen. Wishing everyone chag kosher v'samen. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.